Welcome to Cosmic Classics, Bedtime Stories with Serenia Nix. Beauty and the Beast by Jean-Marie Le Prince de Beaumont Once upon a time, there lived a merchant who was exceedingly rich. He had six children, three boys and three girls, and being a sensible man, he spared no expense upon their education, but engaged tutors of every kind for them. All his daughters were pretty, but the youngest especially was admired by everybody. When she was small, she was known simply as the Little Beauty, and this name stuck to her, causing a great deal of jealousy on the part of her sisters. This youngest girl was not only prettier than her sisters, but very much nicer. The two elder girls were very arrogant as the result of their wealth. They pretended to be great ladies, declining to receive the daughters of other merchants and associating only with people of quality. Every day they went off to balls and theaters and for walks in the park with many a jibe at their little sister, who spent much of her time reading good books. Now, these girls were known to be very rich and, in consequence, were sought in marriage by many prominent merchants. The two eldest said they would never marry unless they could find a duke, or at least a count. But Beauty, this, I have mentioned, was the name by which the youngest was known, very politely thanked all who proposed marriage to her, and said that she was too young at present, and that she wished to keep her father company for several years yet. Suddenly, the merchant lost his fortune, the sole property which remained to him being a small house in the country, a long way from the capital. With tears, he broke it to his children that they would have to move to this house, where by working like peasants, they might just be able to live. The two elder girls replied that they did not wish to leave the town, and they had several admirers who would be only too happy to marry them, notwithstanding the loss of their fortune. But the maidens were mistaken. Their admirers would no longer look at them, now that they were poor. Everybody disliked them on account of their arrogance, and folks declared that they did not deserve pity. In fact, that it was a good thing their pride had had a fall. A turn at minding sheep would teach them how to play the fine lady. But we are very sorry for Beauty's misfortune, everyone added. She is such a dear girl, and was always so considerate to poor people, so gentle, and with such charming manners. There were even several worthy men who would have married her, despite the fact that she was now penniless. But she told them she could not make up her mind to leave her poor father in his misfortune, and that she intended to go with him into the country to comfort him and help him to work. Poor Beauty had been very grieved at first over the loss of her fortune. But she said to herself, However much I cry, I shall not recover my wealth, so I must try to be happy without it. When they were established in the country, the merchant and his family started working on the land. Beauty used to rise at four o'clock in the morning and was busy all day looking after the house and preparing dinner for the family. At first she found it very hard, for she was not accustomed to working like a servant, but at the end of a couple of months she grew stronger and her health improved. When she had leisure, she read, or played the harpsichord, or sang at her spinning wheel. Her two sisters, on the other hand, were bored to death. They did not get up till ten o'clock in the morning, and they idled about all day. Their only diversion was to bemoan the beautiful clothes they used to wear once, and the company they used to keep. Look at our sister, they would say to each other. Her tastes are so low, and her mind so stupid, that she is quite content with this miserable state of affairs. The good merchant did not share the opinion of his two daughters, for he knew that beauty was more fitted to shine in company than her sisters. He was greatly impressed by the girl's good qualities, 
and especially by her patients, for her sisters, not content with leaving her all the work of the house, never missed an opportunity of insulting her. They had been living for a year in this seclusion when the merchant received a letter informing him that a ship on which he had some merchandise had just come safely home. The news nearly turned the heads of the two elder girls, for they thought that at last they would be able to quit their dull life in the country. When they saw their father ready to set out, they begged him to bring back dresses, furs, caps, and finery of every kind. Beauty asked for nothing, thinking to herself that all the money which the merchandise might yield would not be enough to satisfy her sister's demands. "'You have not asked me for anything,' said her father. "'As you are so kind to think of me,' she replied, "'please bring me a rose, for there are none here.' Beauty had no real craving for a rose, but she was anxious not to seem to disparage the conduct of her sisters. The latter would have declared that she purposefully asked for nothing in order to be different from them. The merchant duly set forth, but when he reached his destination, there was a mishap over his merchandise, and after much trouble, he returned poorer than he had been before. With only thirty miles to go before reaching home, he was already looking forward to the pleasure of seeing his children again when he found he had to pass through a large wood. Here he lost himself. It was snowing horribly, the wind was so strong that twice he was thrown from his horse, and when night came on, he made up his mind he must either die of hunger and cold or be eaten by the wolves that he could hear howling all about him. Suddenly he saw, at the end of a long avenue of trees, a strong light. It seemed to be some distance away, but he walked towards it, and presently discovered it came from a large palace which was all lit up. The merchant thanked heaven for sending him this help and hastened to the castle. To his surprise, however, he found no one about in the courtyards. His horse, which had followed him, saw a large stable open and went in and on finding hay and oats in readiness, the poor animal, which was dying of hunger, set to with a will. The merchant tied him up in the stable, and approached the house, where he found not a soul. He entered a large room, and here there was a good fire, and a table laden with food, but with a place laid for one only. The rain and snow had soaked him to the skin, so he drew near the fire to dry himself. I am sure, he remarked to himself, that the master of this house or his servants will forgive the liberty I am taking. Doubtless they will be here soon. He waited some considerable time, but eleven o'clock struck, and still he had seen nobody. Being no longer able to resist his hunger, he took a chicken and devoured it in two mouthfuls, trembling. Then he drank several glasses of wine, and, becoming bolder, ventured out of the room. He went through several magnificently furnished apartments, and finally found a room with a very good bed. It was now past midnight, and as he was very tired, he decided to shut the door and go to bed. It was ten o'clock the next morning when he rose and he was greatly astonished to find a new suit in place of his own, which had been spoiled. This palace, he said to himself, must surely belong to some good fairy who has taken pity on my plight. He looked out of the window, the snow had vanished, and his eyes rested instead upon arbors of flowers, a charming spectacle. He went back to the room where he had supped the night before, and found there was a little table with a cup of chocolate on it. "'I thank you, Madame Fairy,' he said aloud, "'for being so kind as to think of my breakfast.' Having drunk his chocolate, the good man went forth to look for his horse. As he passed under a bower of roses, he remembered that Beauty had asked for one, and he plucked a spray from a mass of blooms. The very same moment— 
he heard a terrible noise and saw a beast coming towards him, which was so hideous that he came near to fainting. Ungrateful wretch, said the beast in a dreadful voice. I have saved your life by receiving you into my castle, and in return for my trouble, you steal that which I love better than anything in the world. You shall pay for this with your life. The merchant threw himself on his knees and wrung his hands. Pardon, my lord, he cried. One of my daughters had asked for a rose. I did not dream I should be giving offense by picking one. I am not called, my lord, answered the monster, but the beast. I have no liking for compliments but prefer people to say what they think. Do not hope, therefore, to soften me by flattery. You have daughters, you say. Well, I am willing to pardon you if one of your daughters will come of her own choice to die in your place. Do not argue and go. Swear that if your daughters refuse to die in your place, you will turn in three months. The good man had no intention of sacrificing one of his daughters to this hideous monster, but he thought at least he might have the pleasure of kissing them once more. He therefore swore to return, and the beast told him he could go when he wished. I do not wish you to go empty-handed, he added. Return to the room where you slept. You will find there a large empty box. Fill it with what you will, and I will have it sent home for you. With these words, the beast withdrew, leaving the merchant to reflect that if he must indeed die, at all events he would have the consolation of providing for his poor children. He went back to the room where he had slept. He found there a large number of gold pieces, and with these he filled the box the beast had mentioned. Having closed the latter, he took his horse, which was still in the stable, and set forth from the palace, as melancholy now as he had been joyous when he entered it. The horse of its own accord took one of the forest roads, and in a few hours the good man reached his own little house. His children crowded round him, but instead of welcoming their hugs, he burst into tears. In his hand was the bunch of roses which he had brought for beauty, and he gave it to her with these words. Take these roses, beauty. It is dearly that your poor father will have to pay for them. Thereupon he told his family of the dire adventure which had befallen him. On hearing the tale, the two elder girls were in a great commotion and began to upbraid beauty for not weeping as they did. See to what her smugness has brought this young chit, they said. Surely she might strive to find some way out of this trouble as we do, but oh dear me, no, her ladyship is so determined to be different that she can speak of her father's death without a tear. It would be quite useless to weep, said Beauty. Why should I lament my father's death? He's not going to die. Since the monster agrees to accept a daughter instead, I intend to offer myself to appease its fury. It will be a happiness to do so, for I shall have the joy of saving my father. No, sister, said her three brothers. You shall not die. We will go in quest of this monster and will perish under his blows if we cannot kill him. Do not entertain any such hopes, my children, said the merchant. The power of this beast is so great that I have not the slightest expectation of escaping him. I am touched by the goodness of beauty's heart, but I will not expose her to death. I am old and have not much longer to live. I shall merely lose a few years that will be regretted only on account of you, my dear children. I can assure you, father, said beauty, that you will not go to this palace without me. You cannot prevent me from following you. Although I am young, I am not so very deeply in love with life, and I would rather be devoured by this monster than die of the grief which your loss would cause me. Words were useless. Beauty was quite determined to go to this wonderful palace, and her sisters were not sorry, for they regarded her good qualities with deep jealousy. 
The merchant was so taken up with the sorrow of losing his daughter that he forgot all about the box which he had filled with gold. To his astonishment, when he had shut the door of his room and was about to retire for the night, there it was at the side of his bed. He decided not to tell his children that he had become so rich, for his elder daughters would have wanted to go back to town, and he had resolved to die in the country. He did confide his secret to Beauty, however, and the latter told them that during his absence they had entertained some visitors, amongst whom were two admirers of her sisters. She begged her father to let them marry, for she was of such sweet nature that she loved them and forgave them with all her heart for the evil they had done her. When Beauty set off with her father, the two heartless girls rubbed their eyes with an onion so as to seem tearful, but her brothers wept, and so did the merchant. Beauty alone did not cry, because she did not want to add to their sorrow. The horse took the road to the palace, and by evening they espied it all lit up as before. An empty stable awaited the nag, and when the good merchant and his daughter entered the great hall, they found there a table magnificently laid for two people. The merchant had not the heart to eat, but Beauty, forcing herself to appear calm, sat down and served him. Since the beast had provided such splendid fare, she thought to herself he must be presumably anxious to fatten her up before eating her. When they had finished supper, they heard a terrible noise. With tears, the merchant bade farewell to his daughter, for he knew it was the beast. Beauty herself could not help trembling at the awful apparition, but she did her best to compose herself. The beast asked her if she had come of her own free will, and she timidly answered that such was the case. You are indeed kind, said the beast and I am much obliged to you. You, my good man, will depart tomorrow morning, and you must not think of coming back. Goodbye, beauty. Goodbye, beast, she answered. Thereupon the monster disappeared. Daughter, said the merchant, embracing beauty, I am nearly dead with fright. Let me be the one to stay here. No, father, said beauty firmly. You must go tomorrow morning and leave me to the mercy of this beast. Perhaps pity will be taken on me. They retired to rest, thinking they would not sleep at all during the night, but they were hardly in bed before their eyes closed in sleep. In her dreams there appeared to Beauty a lady, who said to her, Your virtuous character pleases me, Beauty. In thus undertaking to give your life to save your father, you have performed an act of goodness which shall not go unrewarded. When she woke, Beauty related this dream to her father. He was somewhat consoled by it, but could not refrain from loudly giving vent to his grief when the time came to tear himself away from his beloved child. As soon as he had gone, Beauty sat down in the great hall and began to cry. But she had plenty of courage, and after a time, she was determined to grieve no more during the short time she had yet to live. She was convinced that the beast would devour her that night, but made up her mind that in the interval, she would walk about and have a look at this beautiful castle, the splendor of which she could not help but admire. Imagine her surprise when she came upon a door on which were the words, Beauty's Room. She quickly opened this door and was dazzled by the magnificence of the appointments within. They are evidently anxious that I should not be dull, she murmured as she caught sight of a large bookcase, a harpsichord, and several volumes of music. A moment later, another thought crossed her mind. If I had only a day to spend here, she reflected, such provision would surely not have been made for me. This notion gave her fresh courage. She opened the bookcase and found a book in which was written in letters of gold. Ask for anything you wish. You are mistress of all here. Alas, she said with a sigh, my only wish is to see my poor father and to know what he is doing. 
As she said this to herself, she glanced at a large mirror. Imagine her astonishment when she perceived her home reflected in it and saw her father just approaching. Sorrow was written on his face, but when her sisters came to meet him, it was not impossible to detect, despite the grimaces with which they tried to simulate grief, the satisfaction they felt at the loss of their sister. In a moment the vision faded away, yet Beauty could not but think that the beast was very kind, and that she had nothing much to fear of him. At midday she found the table laid, and during her meal she enjoyed an excellent concert, although the performers were invisible. But in the evening, as she was about to sit down at the table, she heard the noise made by the beast and quaked in spite of herself. Beauty, said the monster to her, may I watch you have your supper? You are master here, said the trembling beauty. Not so, replied the beast. It is you who are mistress. You have only to tell me to go if my presence annoys you, and I will go immediately. Tell me now. Do you not consider me very ugly? I do, said Beauty, since I must speak the truth, but I think you are also very kind. It is as you say, said the monster, and in addition to being ugly, I lack intelligence. As I am well aware, I am a mere beast. It is not the way with stupid people, answered Beauty, to admit a lack of intelligence. Fools never realize it. Sup well, beauty, said the monster, and try to banish dullness from your home, for all about you is yours, and I should be sorry to think you were not happy. You are indeed kind, said beauty. With one thing I must own, I am well pleased, and that is your kind heart. When I think that of you, you no longer seem to be ugly. Oh, yes, answered the beast. I have a good heart right enough, but I am a monster. There are many men, said Beauty, who would make worse monsters than you, and I prefer you, notwithstanding your looks, to those who under the semblance of men hide false, corrupt, and ungrateful hearts. The beast replied that if only he had a grain of wit, he would compliment her in the grand style by way of thanks, but that being so stupid, he could only say he was much obliged. Beauty ate with a good appetite, for she now had scarcely any fear of the beast, but she nearly died of fright when he put this question to her. Beauty, will you be my wife? For some time she did not answer fearing lest she might anger the monster by her refusal. She summoned up courage at last to say, rather fearfully, No, beast. The poor monster gave forth such a terrible sigh that the noise of it went whistling throughout the entire palace. But to Beauty's speedy relief, the beast sadly took his leave and left the room, turning several times as he did so to look once more upon her. Left alone, Beauty was moved by great compassion for this poor beast. What a pity he is so ugly, she said, for he is so good. Beauty passed three months in the palace quietly enough. Every evening the beast paid her a visit and entertained her at supper, by a display of much good sense, if not with what the world would call wit. And every day Beauty was made more aware of the fresh kindnesses on part of the monster, through seeing him often, she had become accustomed to his ugliness, and far from dreading the moment of his visit, she frequently looked forward to the hour when the beast would arrive. One thing alone troubled Beauty. Every evening, before retiring to bed, the monster asked her if she would be his wife, and seemed overwhelmed with grief when she refused. One day she said to him, "'You distress me, beast!' I wish I could marry you, but I cannot deceive you by allowing you to believe that that can ever be. I will always be your friend. Be content with that. Needs must, said the beast. But let me make the position plain. 
I know I am very terrible, but I love you very, very much, and I shall be happy if you only remain here. Promise that you will never leave me. Beauty blushed at these words. She had seen in her mirror that her father was stricken down by the sorrow of having lost her, and she very much wished to see him again. I would willingly promise to remain with you always, she said to the beast, but I have so great a desire to see my father again that I shall die of grief if you refuse me this boon. I would rather die myself than cause you grief, said the monster. I will send you back to your father. You shall stay with him, and your beast shall die of sorrow at your departure. No, no, said Beauty, crying. I like you too much to wish to cause you your death. I promise you I will return in eight days. You have shown me that my sisters are married and that my brothers have joined the army. My father is all alone. Let me stay with him one week. You shall be with him tomorrow morning, said the beast. But remember your promise. All you have to do when you want to return is to put your ring on a table when you are going to bed. Goodbye, Beauty. As usual, the beast sighed when he said these last words, and Beauty went to bed quite downhearted at having grieved him. When she woke the next morning, she found she was in her father's house. She rang a little bell which stood by the side of her bed, and it was answered by their servant, who gave a great cry at the sight of her. The good man came running at the noise, and was overwhelmed with joy at the sight of his dear daughter. Their embraces lasted for more than a quarter of an hour. When their transports had subsided, it occurred to Beauty that she had no clothes to put on. But the servant told her that she had just discovered in the next room a chest full of dresses trimmed with gold and studded with diamonds. Beauty felt grateful to the beast for this attention, and having selected the simplest of gowns, she bade the servant pack up the others as she wished to send them as presents to her sisters. The words were hardly out of her mouth when the chest disappeared. Her father expressed the opinion that the beast wished for her to keep them all to herself, and in a trice the dresses and chest were back again where they were before. When Beauty had dressed, she learned that her sisters, with their husbands, had arrived. Both were very unhappy. The eldest had wedded an exceedingly handsome man, but the latter was so taken up with his own looks that he studied them from morning to night and despised his wife's beauty. The second had married a man with plenty of brains, but he only used them to pay insults to everybody, his wife first and foremost. The sisters were greatly mortified when they saw Beauty dressed like a princess and more beautiful than the dawn. Her tender greetings were ignored, and the jealousy which they could not stifle only grew worse when she told them how happy she was. Out into the garden went the envious pair, there to vent their spleen to the full. Why should this chit be happier than we are? they demanded of each other. Are we not much nicer than she is? Sister, said the elder, I have an idea. Let us try to persuade her to stay longer than the eight days. Her stupid beast will fly into a rage when he finds out she has broken her word and will likely devour her. You are right, sister, said the other. But we must make a great fuss of her if we are to make the plan successful. With this plot decided upon, they went upstairs again and paid such attention to their little sister that Beauty wept for joy. When the eight days had passed, the two sisters tore their hair and showed such grief over her departure that she promised to remain another eight days. Beauty reproached herself, nevertheless, with the grief she was causing to the poor beast. Moreover, she greatly missed seeing him. On the tenth night of her stay in her father's house, she dreamed that she was in the palace garden, where she saw the beast lying on the grass nearly dead, and that he upbraided her for her ingratitude. Beauty woke up with a start and burst into tears. I am indeed very wicked, she said, to cause so much grief to a beast who has shown me nothing but kindness. Is it his fault that he is so ugly and has so few wits? He is good, and that makes up for all the rest. Why did I not wish to marry him? I should have been a good deal happier with him than my sisters are with their husbands. 
It has neither good looks nor brains in a husband that can make a woman happy. It is beauty of character, virtue, kindness, all these qualities the beast has. I admit I have no love for him, but he has my esteem, friendship, and gratitude. At all events, I must not make him miserable, or I shall reproach myself all my life. With these words, Beauty rose and placed her ring on the table. Hardly had she returned to her bed than she was asleep, and when she woke the next morning she saw with joy that she was at the beast's palace. She dressed in her very best on purpose to please him, and nearly died of impatience all day, waiting for nine o'clock in the evening. But the clock struck in vain. No beast appeared. Beauty now thought she must have caused his death, and rushed about the palace with loud, despairing cries. She looked everywhere, and at last, recalling her dream, dashed into the garden by the canal, where she had seen him in her sleep. There she found the poor beast lying unconscious, and thought he must be dead. She threw herself on his body, all her horror of his looks forgotten, and, feeling his heart still beat, fetched water from the canal and threw it on his face. The beast opened his eyes and said to Beauty, You forgot your promise. The grief I felt at having lost you made me resolve to die. But I die content, since I have had the pleasure of seeing you once more. Dear beast, you shall not die, said Beauty. You shall live and become my husband. Here and now I offer you my hand, and swear that I will marry none but you. Alas, I only fancy a friendship for you, but the sorrow I have experienced clearly proves to me that I cannot live without you. Beauty had scarce uttered these words when the castle became ablaze with lights before her very eyes. Fireworks, music, all proclaimed a feast. But these splendors were lost on her. She turned to her dear beast, still trembling for his danger. Judge of her surprise now, at her feet she saw no longer the beast who had disappeared, but a prince more beautiful than love himself, who thanked her for having put an end to his enchantment. With good reason were her eyes riveted upon the prince, but she asked him nevertheless where the beast had gone. You see him at your feet, answered the prince. A wicked fairy condemned me to retain that form until some beautiful girl should consent to marry me, and she forbade me betray any sign of intelligence. You alone in the world could show yourself susceptible to the kindness of my character, and in offering you my crown, I do but discharge the obligation that I owe you. In agreeable surprise, Beauty offered her hand to the handsome prince and assisted him to rise. Together they retired to the castle, and Beauty was overcome with joy to find, assembled in the hall, her father and her entire family. The lady who had appeared to her in her dream had transported them to the castle. Beauty, said this lady, who was a celebrated fairy, come and receive the reward of your noble choice. You preferred merit to either beauty or wit, and you certainly deserve to find these qualities combined in one person. It is your destiny to become a great queen, but I hope that the pomp of royalty will not destroy your virtues. As for you, ladies, she continued, turning to Beauty's two sisters, I know your hearts and the malice they harbor. Your doom is to become statues, and under the stone that wraps you round, you retain all your feelings. You will stand at the door of your sister's palace, and I can visit no greater punishment upon you than that you shall be witnesses to her happiness. Only when you recognize your faults that you can return to your present shape, and I am very much afraid that you will be statues forever. Pride, ill temper, greed, and laziness can all be corrected, but nothing short of a miracle will turn a wicked and envious heart. In a trice, with the tap of her hand, the fairy transported them all to the prince's realm, where his subjects were delighted to see him again. He married Beauty, and they lived happily ever after. The End